study session for May 9th, 2023. And uh, so the first presentation we have is It's Our Country. And Ms. Countryman, if you can come forward and uh, have the children come forward, it is your floor. So you can right here in the middle if you like. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Lori Countryman, and I teach first grade at William Southern Elementary. This is my 24th year of teaching. The last 23 years have been at Southern. That means through your kindness, you have allowed us to take your time. Due to COVID, we have not presented in recent past years. It's great to be back. On behalf of the students and their families, I want to thank you. Everyone is so proud to be in front of you and to be on TV. <laughs> My first grade has been working on a project all year focusing on their place in the world. The name of the project is It's Our Country Man Roll Call. <laughs> and now my first graders will introduce themselves before they begin. Alana Wolf. Adeline McBride. Bailey Nations. Colby Hater. Karina Moore. Keith Few. Aubrey Link. Hayden Turner. Legiano Stewart. Brielle, Brielle Howard. Skylar Bryson. Jeffrey Woodhead. Piper Amsball, Theta Jensen, Who, Who Am I? My name is Adeline Grace McBride. I was born March 2nd, 2016. I am seven years old. Where am I? I live on East 42nd Terrace South. I attend first grade at William Southern Elementary in the city of Independence. In the continent of County of Jackson. In, in the state of Missouri. In the country of the United States of America. USA, 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 USA. On the continent of North America. 
on the continent of North America and Hawaii. <laughs> On the planet Earth, third walk from the sun. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. <laughs> In this universe, in this galaxy, in the solar system of the sun. In the galaxy of the Milky Way. in this universe. So I'll present this to Miss Countryman here if you want to come up or, yeah. and does anybody want to get a picture with all of us? If you guys step forward just a little bit, and we'll get behind you. If I can sneak in behind you, please. And we'll do this, and, and then... Teacher, that if you think I'm, I'm a product of independent schools, you're right. And if you have an issue, Mr. Hoppy can certainly discuss it with you. And this is Mr. Gene Hoppy, one of my favorite teachers at William Christman High School. And he, he made such an impact on so many people with his one line that he loved to say. Do you remember what that is, Mr. Hoppy? Touche. There you go. Thank you. That was nice. Thank you, Lori. Yes, Have a great you. one. Okay, and next we have the AFS presentation, but we'll just wait just a minute for the chamber to be adjusted. I want to warn you, I will probably flub more lines than the kids did. My name is Bruce Lowry. I was the city clerk for 39 years, so I had a few occasions of uh, hearing the, this class when they made presentations uh, a number of years ago. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Mr. City Manager, employees, citizens of independence, uh, I've been involved with AFS since 1984. 
And um, we are here tonight to share the AFS, see, I've already flubbed, the AFS experience. The AFS program began in 1947 when the volunteer ambulance drivers from both World War II and World War I who were volunteers helping the military, they organized a student exchange program for, of hosting in the USA some of the children from the French and German families who had sheltered the American soldiers during the war. The AFS program then started in independence in 1959 when Phil and Lenore Weeks hosted a girl from Osno Osorno, Chile, and now Independence has hosted over 434 students in Independence since then. Thanks to former council member Paige, Dan McGraw, Kathy Vest, and Mark Ma Matt Mallinson, all graduates of Van Horn, we have determined that Van Horn started an AFS program in 1962, but we still need additional information. So we'd be pleased to hear from anyone with additional information about the early part of the history of Van, uh, AFS in Van Horn. Likewise, additional information is needed about the AFS history at Fort Osage prior to 1989, although recently I did receive some significant helpful information from Dick and Ann Franklin. Being closed down for 2021 by COVID and 2022 but by my inaction and the lingering effects to have a minimum of personal contact, we're back now in 2023. So tonight, the Independence AFS organization would like to introduce the two students who have been at Truman all year, and the one student who has been at William Christman since January of this year. Now these students will be leaving Independence in early June on their way back to their home countries. As we approach the end of the year, we sincerely hope they will be returning for visits in the next few years now that they have become a part of the extended families of some independence residents. We anticipate that a number of members of these independence families will also in the next few years be visiting these students in their natural parents' homes and continuing to remain in contact as they start their own families. For most of the people involved, an ongoing relationship has been established. I know that's true for my wife and me. The students here this year now will come and introduce themselves. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Rehan Edres from the Philippines, the other side of the world. So, um, my brother and my host mom is right here, right there. My, that's my brother and my host mom is the one recording me. Um, they, um, my brother is Josh Hemingway and my mom is Marabek. Um, so I'm, I'm currently, so I'm currently going, studying in Truman High School and I'm currently taking a language and some business, uh, business classes last semester, which is a thing that I couldn't do in the Philippines. Um, I also joined Multicultural Club, and I, ha I had a, a lot of friends and learned from them. I also joined Scouting, Scouts, hello Jared. Um, I, uh, I, enjoyed AFS, I enjoyed AFS activities every month when we, for example, when we went to the Jefferson City uh, for the state uh, field trip, um, the World War One Museum, the ice hockey game, the Mavericks ice hockey game, and uh, AFS uh, didn't just make me experience America; it also made me uh, better. It made me more open-minded more um, more understanding and more outgoing. AFS also gave me the opportunity to share my culture in America. And uh, overall the exchange, uh, overall. 
here. Thank you. Well done. Uh, it was really fun experiencing a lot of stuff like I took a US government class which was amazing for me to see how a different type of government functions also it was my first time doing um, a sport for school I did swim for Truman High School um, also on top of that it was uh, thank you so much for providing the tickets to the uh, Mavericks New Year's game uh, I really enjoyed it along with my host family, and I'm glad that I get to, got to come back and see the game again. Uh, the community of independence and all the people in the city uh, are really, like, as far as, like, kids go, and my host family, who's right there sitting and <laughs> recording me, they're amazing. <laughs> I haven't had a single issue coming here, so thank you so much for being an amazing city. Thank you. <clears throat> um, greetings and good evening everyone. My name is Afna Naili and you can just call me Naili. I am 15 years old and I'm one of the AFS exchange students from Malaysia. Um, I am currently enrolled in William Christman High School as a senior. I participated in track and theater for extracurriculars and we just had a track, the musical show, a few weeks ago and it was a huge success. Um, last week, the track season ended, and I had a lot of fun um, going to track meets and practice with my teammates. Um, furthermore, my favorite classes here are theater production, forensic science, culinary, and also microbiology. I find it very interesting how there's a wide variety of choices in elective classes compared to Malaysia. Um, moreover, as Rahan said, we AFS organized a few activities for us Kansas City Area Exchange students, which include the Harvesters, the Jefferson City trip, and we have um, we will be going to Chicago at the end of May, and I'm pretty excited about that. Um, last but not least, I would like to express my gratitude to AFS for providing me this opportunity to be here, and I learned a lot, improved my English. Um, learn the culture and religious practices here and I would say that this is one of the best experience I ever had in my life and I would also like to thank all of you for having me here and it was um, a pleasure to meet you thank you thank you Th thank you to the council for giving us the opportunity to uh, share the AFS experience uh, with you and, and the uh, the audience, <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I do want to introduce uh, Kathy Hallberg on the front row. She's uh, been the volunteer coordinator and the uh, do everything else person for the last couple of years, and now she's going to be the area chairman for the entire Kansas City area. In Kansas City this year, we have 29 students, uh, and I, I didn't get the list of how many schools they're at or uh, uh, how many different countries, but it's uh, 18 schools and <laughs> 20 or 25 countries. And uh, we, we look forward to next year. It, it runs on the school year uh, approach. So anyone who would like to uh, uh, host next year a student almost as good as these students uh, get in touch with uh, Kathy or myself and uh, we'll talk about it. One of my problems is my 
age. I'm not connected to the schools anymore, nor are my children, nor are my grandchildren. <laughs> so uh, we don't know who to talk to. So we would take any leads that you could uh, provide for us. Would you like to give a, if students come back up in front? If you don't have any other questions for me, we'll uh, Mr. Mayor, let you get to your regular business. As you're making your way back to your chair, I, we, we, uh, our family hosted three different AFS students back when our kids were in school. And um, I just would tell the community that it is a great experience. Um, we had um, kids from Thailand, from Norway, and from Switzerland. And, um, and then um, as, RJ said he's uh, in our scout troop right now along with Josh and uh, so I've gotten to know them this year or no I've known Josh for a long time but I've gotten to know RJ this year and um, uh, just a, a great program and it certainly helps um, our it helped our kids to expand their horizons they've gone and visited their their uh, host siblings and or their siblings uh, from AFS and and so uh, it's been a, a great experience for us. We, we've hosted three times. Kathy's hosted more than that. And Kathy's, <clears throat> don't be fooled by the age appearance. She's been involved with AFS longer than I have. She was a sibling <laughs> in high school. I hope the audience could hear that. With her experience, she went into international education and used her AFX experience to actually win an award in a uh, theme presentation. And, and um, to also indicate the expanse of independence, a couple sitting here hosted in 1988-89, and I had lost track of, of them until sitting by them this evening. So they're AFS parents as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Great job. All right, all right. Mr. City Manager, that brings us to our budget presentation. And whenever you're ready, you have the floor. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, I think I should lodge a formal complaint that I have to follow adorable students uh, <laughs> with budget information, but we'll, we'll make it work. Um, it is a pleasure to be here again this year to submit to you your proposed budget for uh, the fiscal year ending July, one, uh, pardon me, June uh, 30, 2024, uh, in accordance with section 8.2 of the city charter. Before continuing tonight, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that this week marks uh, Public Service Recognition Week. Uh, every good story has a protagonist, and for that, that is our employees of this city. So I'd like to thank all of our city employees who make the story you're about to hear possible each and every day. Uh, I'd also like to thank everybody who helped make the budget proposal possible this year. I'd like to thank the mayor and council for delivering me and my leadership team with a very focused, action-oriented strategic plan that lays out your priorities clearly. 
I'd like to thank our citizens who completed our annual budget survey and provided additional context on their priorities. Of course, I'd like to thank our department directors and other city staff who've spent countless hours preparing uh, the thoughtful proposals and worked hard uh, to bring our budget into balance under a highly resource-restricted environment. I'd like to thank the communications team for aiding in the preparation of the budget books that you all have, uh, as well as the presentation you'll see tonight. If it were up to me, you'd all be getting a presentation made of construction paper and crayon, so thank you, uh, communication team. And finally, I'd like to thank my incredible budget team, Director of Finance Cindy Gray, Budget Manager Melissa Sill, and Budget Analyst Turner Adams. This group has sacrificed countless nights, weekends, and working hours to bring our budget picture into focus. Their ingenuity and their innovation uh, has helped us navigate a highly volatile economic climate and bring forth a budget proposal that continues taking steps towards uh, making this the community we all expect. The proposed budget totals $395,000,000 $32,728, or an increase of 6.8% over the fiscal year 22-23 adopted budget. Budget growth is driven primarily by capital improvements, enabled in part by the revenue increases approved by voters, such as the fire sales tax, which is funding the construction or renovation of our fire stations across the city. Operating expenditures have increased by a total of seven point two percent due to factors such as inflation accounting for the many technology uh, um, implementation projects and other technology services expenditures these technology related expenses were long deferred leaving our organization in a vulnerable position we are now playing catch-up which is good but it certainly impacts our budget equipment expenses are up 128% as departments are purchasing equipment that is much more expensive than would have been found even one to two years ago. While we are budgeting for those items, we do <laughs> remain unsure if these items will actually be available for purchase or we may have to wait six to nine months due to supply chain issues. Before diving deeper into this year's budget, let's set the table with a look back at where we've been. What I want you to take away from this chart is that our salary expenses are down from adopted budget by about $7.5 million, and our operating expenses are well above budget. The salary savings are a result of the labor shortages and the difficulty in filling vacant positions, which I'll discuss more uh, as we go through our presentation. General fund is expected to add to fund balance this year, bringing it to a total of 10.5%. We still are working to achieve a 16% reserve as required by ordinance and as is considered a best practice. Although 10.5% is a significant improvement in the city's overall financial position, I must be straightforward and acknowledge that this increase is not structural in nature as it reflects savings primarily from personal, personnel vacancies and other one-time savings. The estimated expenditures in the sales tax funds are down due primarily to having to scale back in the amount that is available for capital improvements. As with the general fund, the utility funds are up in expenditures due to an increase in capital spending. Salary expenses are also lower in the three utility funds due to the same ongoing labor shortage issues. So, there are challenges on the horizon, and in order to sustain the strong momentum underway, we have to address the issue that continues to threaten local governments across the country, and one that you've heard me preach many a time. The means by which local governments have long been funded continues to be eroded dramatically and rapidly. And in order to maintain the fiscal health that we have worked so hard to build, we have to work collectively to manage our finances and to seek new sustainable funding strategies. 
Today's persistent new reality is change. The economy has changed, the competition has changed, the talent demands have changed, life cycles have changed, customer demands have changed, even the pace of change has changed. To survive, we have to become more nimble as an organization, and to become more nimble, we have to first become more financially sustainable. In the past, we have weathered economic challenges by delaying capital improvements or making strategic use of one-time revenues. Our citizens rightfully expect superior delivery of basic services to be provided by the City of Independence. Meeting these expectations without growth in revenue requires a realignment of dollars away from legacy programs and redundant services. Recognizing this reality, I began working with my staff this past year to address this challenge. The team and I focused on an innovative approach to optimize our resources and control long-term costs, to provide services that are reliable and sustainable, and to identify solutions through collaboration and open communication. Our economy today is defined by a high degree of volatility. As an organization, we struggle to find available labor to fill our vacant positions. We continue to have a significant labor shortage in this country. Nationally, we do have a higher percent of labor force participation than was the case before COVID, but we still have an immediate labor shortfall. There are about 4 million less workers in the economy today than in 2020, and many people wonder where did the workers go? Well, 500,000 workers died of COVID, 2 million older workers left the workforce early, and there has been a decline of 1.5 million new immigrants into our country. Many economists forecast a crippling labor shortage by 2030, as our fertility rate has declined from 3.7 kids in 1960 to 1 1.6 kids in 2020. Moreover, 44% of the population aged 18 to 49 state they are unlikely to ever have kids. Inflation also remains stubbornly high. Inflation from 22 to 23 was 5%. We can start thinking tailwinds with inflation when we hit 2.5%, but until then, we're facing strong headwinds. U.S. consumer spending has also been difficult to forecast. There have been crazy swings in sales tax with all the federal COVID aid and stimulus checks. However, the $2 trillion in federal funding that's been sloshing around in the economy for the last three years is just about gone, and consumer spending does appear to be returning to normal levels. There's also a high degree of uncertainty pummeling the banking industry. It's troubling enough to hear from our de development community that banks aren't as eager about lending these days. But the bigger worry is that bank failures might lead to doubts about relatively healthy banks, creating a financial contagion that could impact the wider economy. And finally, as you've probably heard, Congress and the White House continue to barrel toward a J June 1st deadline to resolve a debate over the debt ceiling, putting the credit and trust of the United States on the line. The Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, has said that failing to lift or suspend the debt ceiling would lead to a, quote, economic and financial catastrophe, darkening a U.S. economic outlook already clouded by elevated inflation, high interest rates, and unease in the banking industry. So what does that mean for us in independence? Well, in the worst case scenario, economists say that a protracted default lasting longer than three months would trigger a Great Recession type of scenario in which as many 8.3 million people could lose their jobs. In that situation, the stock market could fall by as much as 45%, hurting the accounts of those saving for retirement. In 2023, the Independent City Council adopted the Independence Action Plan setting forward six strategic purposes for our organization. This document, which remains a living document, has provided much needed focus for our organization as we seek to align council expectations within our available resources. 
Simply cutting programs is not the answer to financial sustainability. Even simply eliminating low priority programs may not be the answer. This is a counterintuitive strategy that will have the catastrophic impact of depleting our ability to deliver basic services, which will in turn negatively impact the quality of life and diminish our ability to recruit businesses and residents into our community. Instead, we should focus on reallocating resources to improve the efficiency and the fiscal sustainability of both short and long-term programs. We should structure lower priority programs to have better cost recovery. For example, if fewer members of the public use the service that we provide, let's explore charging them for that service. We should ask ourselves, are we competing with other agencies or for-profit businesses for service? If we are, we should ask ourselves, should we? This budget represents a dedication to achieving the action plan and starting to ask those questions. As a staff, we're excited to see the council recommitting to a strong action plan and how departments have already began to incorporate that action plan into their day-to-day -day planning activities. We're going to strengthen this process next year by incorporating the process of priority-based budgeting, which will allow us to align our strategic initiatives directly to budgeted dollars and develop true costs of service. We've laid the groundwork with the action plan and we've tested the waters with our capital improvements process this year. Next year, we'll take a deeper dive into the operating budgets. Traditional budgets, use it or lose it mentality and across the board budget cuts that don't consider factors other than percentage make it difficult to connect funding with strategic goals or performance metrics. Data-driven information will move us from an output to an outcome-based decision and help you as the council make smarter policy decisions. With that background in mind, we are able to start shaping the budget picture. We began this process in earnest back in February of this year. As revenues in the general fund came into focus, we noticed higher property tax valuations, which I'll discuss more in a moment. We also noticed sales tax coming in with an increase at about 4.1% growth. Annual growth currently sits at 6.1% for the last 12 months, but as I mentioned, we're starting to see a leveling out and a return to normal. Pilots were estimated to be up by about half a million dollars, and interfund charges, the charges for services between departments, is up $2.2 million in line with those technology investments I mentioned earlier. Regarding expenditures, we are adding again this year to the fund balance, which I will mention momentarily. We've also been able to fund 52 of the 74 requests put forward by departments, totaling $5.2 million in new spending. Finally, we are utilizing a hiring chill this year. This allows us to right size our budget with when and how we can expect to fill positions vacancy wise. Positions will be advertised after I have had the opportunity to review the budget to ensure that we are on track to be able to afford to fill said positions. Taking a deeper look into the general fund. We estimate that revenue will decre decrease compared to fiscal year 21-22, primarily due to the loss of federal American Rescue Plan funds. Even with the expected increase in pilots from Independence Power and Light, we are still budgeting conservatively based on our three-year average. Independence Power and Light has seen an increase of about 1,000 new customers since 2018. Sales tax is budgeted at a 4.1% increase. And as I mentioned, the city is seeing about a 6.1% growth over the last year. Assessed valuation is expected to increase in this budget. 
The county has informed us that residential property assessed valuation will be increasing significantly. However, as a city, we are limited by state statute in how much new additional revenue we are allowed to see in a single year. Commercial property assessments are expected to be much more modest. At this time, we are still awaiting the valuations of new construction in our city. General fund expenditures are down compared to actual spending in fiscal year 21-22, but higher than the forecast for fiscal year 22-23. As I mentioned, there are vacancy factors in the budgeted salaries and benefits for fiscal year 23-24. Positions are not being eliminated or frozen, but we will be examining what and when positions can be filled based on budgetary trends. There is an increase in finance and administration allocations to include additional charges needed for our technology upgrades and truing up the charges and expenditures for past project implementations. A budget is a statement of values. So let's talk about where general fund dollars are allocated. 77 cents of every dollar in the general fund is spent on public safety. Eight cents is spent on municipal services, things like engineering, design, streets and sidewalks. Eight cents is spent on community development, things like public transit, code enforcement, dangerous building demolition, historic preservation, plan review, and permitting activities. Two cents is spent on municipal court, and approximately five cents in total is spread out over administrative charges such as the mayor and council office, the city manager's office, law, and other non-departmental functions. This budget focuses on financial sustainability by meeting the City Council's objective of improving long-range financial planning and decision-making. A key component of this strategy has been updating and developing the City's financial policies, including setting new unrestricted fund balance targets for each of our funds. We're anticipating considerable savings in the 22-23 projections, which as I mentioned, increases our unassigned fund balance to 10.5%. We're presently um, presenting you with a conservative budget, anticipating revenue growth in several areas. However, expenditures are still outpacing revenue growth. Inflation is causing the cost of materials and supplies to increase. Protecting public assets through cybersecurity, health insurance increases, and necessary market adjustments is also a priority. One area that remains a concern is public transit. Funding is in place for fiscal year 23-24 to maintain our existing levels of public transit service. However, those funds are not available after this fiscal year. We will need to identify an additional $1.3 million to fund our current system by next fiscal year. This coming fiscal year, we estimate we will spend about $3 per rider but in two years, that cost will skyrocket to over $8 per rider as federal COVID relief dollars are phased out. The conundrum here is that we simply do not have enough riders to cover the cost of operating this service, but we recognize the vital role this service plays for some of the most vulnerable members of our community. This budget addresses the strategy of providing competitive and sustainable employee pay and benefits, along with advancing the employee wellness program to contain health insurance and workers' compensation costs. The budget funds commitments made in previously negotiated work agreements with represented employees. For all other employees, this budget Pardon me, this budget provides a fair yet sustainable 3% across the board wage increase. This represents the largest across the board wage increase for non-represented employees since I was hired as city manager in 2016. Frankly, I wish we were positioned 
to provide a higher increase. While we have a market adjustment for non-represented employees, inflation still has an impact on household budgets. I do hope this offers some much needed relief for our dedicated and talented city workforce. Employee health insurance costs also continue to rise. The budget does recommend a 10% premium increase on January 1 in accordance with the recommendations of the Stay Well Committee and the Special Health Insurance Review Committee. Additionally, I recommend no structural changes to any of the health insurance plans, including that of our retirees, as our third party insurance advisor has indicated we need a year of calm to assess the impact of the changes from the past several years. We've made no changes in accordance with that recommendation and will continue to monitor the performance of the fund. We are projecting the voter approved use tax to grow at about 4%. Both the police and animal shelter functions will see more than a 9% increase next year, but other funds are budgeted to receive less. Nationally, about 80% of sales tax still comes from brick and mortar stores. In independence, that figure is below that average at about 67%, meaning one third of our sales tax revenue now flow directly into the use tax. As we budget in future years, we'll need to be cognizant of this shift in consumer behavior and adjust accordingly. We estimate that the sales tax funds will grow at the same projected 4.1% growth for general sales tax. Fire has a considerably higher growth rate due to the recently approved increase in their sales tax. New this year is the marijuana sales tax fund. Collections will begin by businesses on October 1, and we expect to see our first receipts in either December or January. We are conservatively estimating revenue at $150,000 due to only receiving six months of revenue. However, I won't be surprised if that figure is exceeded. Since becoming legal in Missouri on February 3rd, dispensaries across the state have sold more than $256 million in product. Now let's focus on our utilities. Municipal Services has identified $31.6 million in projects for this coming year, and we expect to receive, receive $15.2 million in grants to help support these projects. These will be approved by the council as funds are awarded and will not be expended until received and approved by council. Independence Power and Light is proposing $14.8 million in capital improvements for the next year, plus purchasing additional equipment. The Water Fund is proposing $8 million in capital improvements for next year as we continue to accelerate our water main replacement program. On the radar is the need to conduct a cost of service study for the sanitary sewer utility. Continued environmental regulations are changing the nature of this business and placing greater cost burdens on the utility. Inflation is also an important factor to all three utilities, as well as supply chain issues. Departments have budgeted for these projects, but there may be delays due to unavailability of materials. Also affecting these departments is the ability to hire personnel, particularly engineers and other crucial roles. Here's a look at the forecasted revenues and proposed expenses for each of the three utilities. As you can see, each of the three utilities is budgeted to spend more than they collect. In the case of the water department, that is intentional as we accelerate the capital maintenance program and spin their fund balance down to targeted levels. In the case of the sewer fund, this drawdown is the product of increased expenses, as I mentioned from environmental regulations, as well as a stagnant customer base. We will be proposing a cost of service study this year to be performed as previously indicated. In the case of the electric utility, this represents yet another year of insufficient revenues to meet the needs of the department. The electric utility has not had a rate adjustment in over 10 years 
and experienced a 6% rate reduction uh, in plan revenues in fiscal year 2018-19. I'm hard pressed to think of anything that costs 6% less than it did 11 years ago. If we want to maintain the integrity of our utility, we have to invest in it. That's why I'm using this budget to propose and advance the recommendation from the Public Utility Advisory Board that rates be returned to their 2012 levels. This doesn't solve the long-term financial health of power and light, but it's an important first step that buys us time while we engage in the concurrent studies leading up to the public vote as directed by the council. Without terminating this program, we will fall below our minimum reserve for IPL in just three years. Additionally, resuming the original rate structure will have a positive impact on the general fund. IPL is a business that operates in our city. Just like water, sewer, and gas company, as, law, as well as Evergy for the portions of the city they operate in, they pay our voter approved 9.08% pilot rate. Resumption of the 2012 rate structure will generate an additional $600,000 for the general fund and help avoid any reductions to current service level. That brings us back to this chart. As you can see again, the general fund largely supports police and fire services. Without this rate adjustment, these service levels are in jeopardy. It's just simple math with 77 cents of every dollar going to public safety. We're extremely limited on where we can make budgetary adjustments with that kind of proportional rate. Now, let's turn our attention to how this budget begins to implement your action plan. Again, I'll mention that the proposed budget does not reduce current service levels, which, by the way, was no easy task. There are, however, some expansion in the existing budget as we accepted 52 new proposals from departments. In the area of being an engaged community, we've budgeted a total of $300,000 for elections. We know for certain that there will be district council elections next April and are assuming that there will be primaries in February. How far $300,000 will carry us, I can't say for sure, but that's how much we're proposing to budget. In the area of an innovative economy, there are two items in this area I'd like to highlight. First, we'll be exploring a pilot program we're calling the Neighborhood Tourism Fund. The idea here is to partner with established organizations who are providing great programming in our community to help them grow and advance their efforts. These grassroots programs like Sounds on the Square, the Wine and Brew Walk, Ghoul's Night Out, Wine Fest, and the Strawberry Festival have become highly anticipated events each year with regional and even national followings. I can think of no better way to bring people to town than by supporting existing partners with established track records. Second, I'd like to note this is our first full year as members in the newly established Independence Economic Development Partnership. Last year, the Civic Community and the Council collaborated to bring the Economic Development Council under the umbrella of the Chamber of Commerce, eliminating redundancy and strengthening the capacity of both organizations. Our next strategic area is a well-planned city. This budget focuses on improving the visual appearance of the city. This is achieved primarily through the various capital projects that we are planning in the next budget year. First, I'd like to talk about the many investments we are making to enhance public infrastructure and the visual appearance of independence. Pavement preventative maintenance is a project that will also bring ADA ramps into compliance and fix curbs along selected routes. Streets included in the city's annual resurfacing project are carefully evaluated and inspected. This year, the city will be utilizing multiple treatment options in order to maximize our investment. The Square Streetscape is a four-phase project to revitalize the historic Independence Square. The first phase will focus on construction in the inner ring of the square located on Main, Maple, Liberty, and Lexington Streets. Improvements include traffic reconfiguration, bikeway facilities, sidewalk improvements, 
pedestrian amenities, streetscape enhancements, and utility improvements. The Truman Connected Phase I project will create a multimodal spine along major streets in Western Independence, connecting transportation users of all types along seven and a half miles of roadway. Phase I includes creating multimodal transit options from the Inglewood Arts District through the Historic Square and up to the Truman Library. Bicycle lanes will be installed on Winter, Lexington, Spring Streets, as well as Best Truman Parkway. Truman Connected Phase Two is a project providing new sidewalks, dedicated bike lanes, curbs and gutters, sidewalk ramps and storm sewer improvements, and street trees along Sterling from Winter Road to 23rd Street. Nolan Road Project will create approximately 1.7 miles of multimodal transit corridor along Nolan Road from 24 Highway to Fair Street. And the 23rd Street Complete Streets Project will construct new sidewalks, pedestrian signal upgrades, sidewalks, and street trees on both sides of 23rd Street between Lee Summit Road and Missouri Highway 291. Also in the area of a well-planned city, we're making additional investments to strengthen our neighborhoods. We propose allocating $19,500 for a new software system known as Rentalscape. The supply of vacation rentals has overwhelmed and outpaced local resources responsible for properly regulating its growth. The robust activity of rental space has given rise to unregulated hosts who have avoided the required taxes, fees, and other city codes associated with complying as a short-term rental facility. Rentalscape provides municipalities the ability to monitor, discover, and inspect local short-term rentals with a higher level of accuracy. This allows the city to properly regulate rental hosts and ensure compliance in our area. Similarly, the budget proposes allocating $25,000 for professional services to support the proper and timely registration of rental properties in the community. With this assistance, the city will be better positioned to ensure all landlords are complying with city codes, ensuring the safety of our residents, the stability of our neighborhoods, and equality among all landlords. The budget also proposes $4,500 to serve as a match for a historic preservation grant. Specifically, the grant is for planning purposes as our historic preservation guidelines have not been updated for many years. Finally, I'd like to brag for a minute and note that the budget sustains the current level of funding for property maintenance code enforcement and dangerous building demos. I'd be remiss if I didn't celebrate two notable wins in this area. As of today, 45% of dangerous building cases in our city are classified as being under repair by the property owner. This is a remarkable turnaround from just a few years ago and helps to preserve our limited resources for addressing other neighborhood quality of life issues. I'm truly grateful to the property owners that are taking a more active role in maintaining their property with their resources. My second brag is on our code enforcement officers who are to be commended for taking a more proactive approach. In 2022, 28% of code enforcement cases were officer initiated, representing a 17% increase in proactive enforcement over 2021. As mentioned in the area of financial sustainability, the budget proposes allocating $364,005 to the general fund reserves, which will bring us up to 10.5%. Unfortunately, but necessarily, the budget also recommends a reduction in force of one FTE. However, we are already working on job placement with this employee in another position within the organization. The most significant change in this year's budget comes in the area of a self safe and welcoming community. Specifically, the fire department budget is increased this year due to the approval of the one half percent fire protection sales tax in November 2021. The new tax allows us to continue provisions for apparatus, equipment, maintenance and training for the department. 
It's also providing funds to maintain full staffing on our apparatus, to add an additional unit, and to add one additional battalion chief per shift, or a total of three new FTEs. Planning has also begun on station replacement and addition. Soon, the council will hear a presentation from Chief Short on the department's new strategic goals. Additional positions being added as a result of this tax include um, additional firefighting personnel as we are finally starting to see savings from their overtime and other pays as a result of onboarding new positions. Finally, the ARCH paramedic is 75% funded by federal COVID relief dollars this year and 15% funded by the marijuana sales tax, which will begin its collections later this year. For the first time since the voters approved the use tax, the police department has filled enough positions to begin utilizing these officers. There still remains a lead time of one year from the start of the police academy to see these positions impact our operational efficiency. However, it cannot be overstated that city support and recruitment efforts across the agency are working. The department had to be very creative this year in order to acquire fleet. Within an extremely volatile market and under the aforementioned supply chain pressures, the police department was able to successfully acquire over 60 vehicles and have already deployed 45 of those into service. This replaced all of our aging administrative fleet, allowing us to position ourselves to focus on frontline enforcement vehicles for the next several fiscal years. Specifically proposed in this budget are several other acquisitions, including an IPD mobile command post. Police currently does not have a fully functioning command post. The department is utilizing the breath alcohol testing van, which is way too small and ineffective on critical incidents and major crime scenes. The vehicle's old, outdated, and the technology in the vehicle is not operational for the needs. Um, there's a significant fund balance in the public safety sales tax, which allows us to make this acquisition. Also, given the highly regulated and highly scrutinized nature of policing in America today, I believe it a critical investment to allocate $101,000 for IPD to have their own general legal counsel. This has been a request of the department for the past several years, and I believe it is an expense we can no longer afford to ignore. The budget proposes an additional $55,000 increase for police detention housing. There is currently only one location where the department can house prisoners, and that location is increasing their daily fees from $44 a day to $50 a day, and then to another $60 a day by January 1 of next year. We will also be required to pay for a minimum of 35 beds every day. This does not include trip fees that are $20 each and every time they transport our prisoners to their location, which is at least one per day. The amount requested will allow us to cover the minimum amount of that housing cost for 23-24 fiscal year. And finally, in the area of a high performance organization, we recommend $17,000 to support a record request software system jointly requested by the city clerk's office as well as the police department. This citywide platform will allow the more efficient uh, fulfilling of records request as PD accounts for approximately 90% of our organization's record requests. We re recommend $33,000 for supervisory training for our city employees, $429,000 to fulfill the city council approved timekeeping software, $40,000 for targeted salary adjustments for city employees, and $117,000 to keep up with technology investments. We've come a long way in the area of technology and cannot afford to fall behind again. As we embark on the new fiscal year, independence finds itself on the cusp of a great reawakening. We find ourselves standing on new and different ground 
which requires new and different thinking, as well as new and different approaches. In part, that starts with utilizing our new resources, like the fire sales tax and the marijuana sales tax to advance our promised public safety projects. Safety and security are among the most basic of human needs. But we also must challenge our thinking to address the long-standing issues that challenge our fiscal stability. We must reinvent the ways in which we deliver our services, for no healthy city has ever cut its way to prosperity. Instead, I challenge all of us, elected officials, city staff, community partners, the business and civic community, the leaders of our labor organizations, and our residents to collectively dialogue about reallocating our existing resources to align with our community priorities while also identifying new streams of revenue for our community. Only then will sustainable change be made. Our city's history is rooted in a pioneer spirit of innovation, and we must summon that attitude in the present tense to cement our standing as a community of choice in the regional, national, and global economy. Following tonight's presentation, the city will host the required public budget hearing next Monday night, May 15th. First reading of the budget ordinance will occur at the June 5th city council meeting and second and final reading of the budget ordinance will occur at the June 20th, 2023 city council meeting. I wanna thank you, the city council and the city departments for the assistance that was provided in preparing the budget. As with any year, the options presented as part of this budget are not easy choices. And over the next 45 days, my staff and I stand ready to address any questions regarding the information presented. Together, we will ensure the long-term financial sustainability of our city while providing the services that truly make independence great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Uh, any questions from the council members? Please proceed. Mr. City Manager, in your revenue projections, you're anticipating a 4% increase in uh, revenue from sales tax. Did, do I recall that correctly? That is correct. And we think that that's just inflationary based. So as the price of goods go up, the price that the amount that people pay in sales tax, or you think that there will be additional sales or help me understand that. I think the inflationary component is more a result of the 6% growth we've seen over the last 12 months. We are forecasting 4% to reflect more of a normalizing back uh, in line with growth in the pre-COVID world. So we think 4% is a um, reasonable estimate that will be reflective of actual growth and not uh, any sort of additional dollars sloshing around in the economy or the inflationary economy. It just reminds me and hopefully us how important it is to spend your money in your hometown since that supports all of the costs of running a city. Um, so as people who live on the edges of independence, shop in other communities, really think about bringing your dollars back to independence. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Please proceed. Thank you, Mayor. I, I want to just ask off of that. I mean, with, you are projecting what is a, our current inflation rate? Over the last 12 months, it's been about 6%. Oh, pardon me, pardon me. The inflation amount has been 5%. 5%? Yeah. So, and, and you say that that's <clears throat> our 4% sales tax increase, that's part of your factoring to the 5% because we know it's not going to stay the same. No, no, it, uh, I agree. But um, because sales tax has been up 6% over the last 12 months, uh, we decided to bring that down in line with what we see as the normalizing of the consumer economy. Uh, but we still think it will be high enough that 4% is a responsible revenue estimate. Yeah, because things are still shifting. I mean, Agreed. this week they've been talking about stagflation, which means that now we're going to start seeing job loss. That's going to be part of it, too. Uh, so I'm concerned. Are you surprised by that? Every uh -huh. year I do this. <laughs> but the first year I came here, we were looking at about a 10-year projection before we reached this point. And now we're kind of at that point. Um, so it's kind of... 
escalating this. So to have these honest discussions is important. Um, so my concern is with the county raising assessments to the tune of what will be reflective of about 30 percent, that's money out of our people's pockets. Yes, it is. Was that factored into this 4 percent increase? The four is the sales tax number. Well, I understand, but yeah. this is revenue that, that is taken from incomes of each household and, and I, I, I taken track to what the you're county. saying. Uh, so um, that's that's one of my concerns is I, I, that we, we can stand and project the four percent sales increase, but if you take less money out of the consumer's pocket to spend, you're gonna have less sales tax revenue. I, I track what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And then if we add six percent to utility rates yeah, that's going to impact that. Everything that we do, you made it, you made it some, and I, and I agree with you on this where you said you can't cut your way to prosperity, but government's never been able to tax its way there either. So we need to be real careful in how we're balancing your revenue projection with all these things that are coming to our households in the city limits. And if we're taking, if the county is wanting 30% more, and we want 6% more, I don't know how we're going to see, and, and inflation being at 5%, which could easily jump another percent to, I just, I'm just being cautious, and maybe I, you know, it's just me. Um, I just caution us getting excited about a 4% sales tax increase when we see household revenues being challenged moving forward. Um, you don't have to answer. Oh, no, I'm, I, that's just a cautionary one. Certainly. Uh, my other question is, when you said that um, that when you said that we needed to eliminate one FTE, but we're going to move them over here. So how do we reduce by moving them laterally? It'll be one less position in the organization. But as I mentioned, with our labor shortages, we have no shortage of vacant positions so right. um, city's policy is that if your position one that's subject to a reduction in force you have right of first refusal for any position in the city that you are qualified for right but you said we're going to do a hiring chill correct so but strategic i mean chill right so and i yeah. get what you're saying i'm just yeah. saying, i'm saying just i want to hear you correctly you're, you're, good, we're good supposed questions. to eliminate an FTE, but we're going to move them laterally. We're really not losing them, but we're filling another position that we're going to have a hiring chill on. I'm okay with a hiring chill as long as it's not in public safety, in anywhere. Fire, police, animal control. I just I don't want to see a, a hiring chill there. So is that projected too or no? It is, and not to be argumentative, but something's got to give. I understand. And when 77 cents on every dollar goes into public safety, we either got to have them play by the same rules or we have to stop, stop doing some of these other basic services. And you're not being argumentative, so don't, yeah. don't, don't say that. But, but when we say we're going to reduce, we're not going to fill, we're not going to increase public safety, I don't want the message to be to our community that we now have a handle on crime and drugs and violent crime and all the things that are going on we don't so for us to be reducing budgets hiring freezes um, in a time when we haven't achieved that safe community level yet if if 22 people show up tomorrow to apply to be a police officer I will figure out You'll a way to them. bring them in okay absolutely well, then we'll just keep asking people to come apply I I appreciate the honesty. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Councilmember. Uh, anyone else? Other questions? Mr. Mayor. Please proceed. And I've also uh, been asked by people that have been watching this that make sure that we get close to the microphone when we speak so they can hear us cl clearly. So I apologize. I should have mentioned that earlier. But uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I just. I just remembered to remind folks. I just wanted to make sure. How's this, on. Mr. Mayor? That's Is that uh, good, Mr. Bob? Can you hear me, <laughs> Mr. City Councilmember? That is more than adequate. Thank you. Very good, um, Mr. Walker. Um, excellent summary. 
Uh, I'm sure I'll have this read by tonight and get you a couple pages of questions. Um, no, seriously, thank you for, um, for you and your staff. Uh, this is obviously a year-long uh, process, an ongoing process, and a monumental lift. So thank you, and thank you to Ms. Gray and her staff as well. Um, the bus. Yeah. How long do we have a bus? We are funded at our current service level, the routes, the number of buses, the number of drivers through June 30, 2024. Okay. Um, if, if, pardon me, sir, if this budget's adopted. Fair enough. Have we looked at cheaper alternatives? I know that some cities have gone to ride sharing, cards, um, smaller buses, other things like that. Is that, are any of those an option or things for us to look at? The great question. Uh, all of those things you mentioned are options. Uh, we are running the cost benefit analysis on that as we speak, uh, looking to determine, um, you know, return on investment, make sure there's not hidden fees, hidden costs, things like that. So we're running a multitude of scenarios through the ringer right now. Um, and it may be, a series of options to help sustain our um, operation. But what you mentioned is is compelling in the vein that we, we have a lower number of riders, but they are usually trying to get to very specific places. They're trying to get to medical appointments, to the grocery store, to places of employment or the social service agency. So having that direct point to point rather yeah. than the fixed route on face value has some promise that it could be a cost savings because you're not taking circuitous routes to places. Yeah, it really is. Um, it's easy to discount uh, folks that don't have cars. Uh, it's easy to discount the sort of less fortunate folks, uh, but they're important. Uh, they're really important and they are doing important things. and we definitely need to not, of course, forget them. We know you haven't, uh, and we haven't up here either, but um, we need to be a, as efficient as possible, but we also need to provide for them. So, and I commend the council. I know many of you have taken the opportunity to ride the bus yourselves to see firsthand that experience and or have spoken with me about getting that scheduled. So um, the council is to be commended for, for taking firsthand interest in that as well. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, the uh, 6%, uh, I don't want to call it a rate increase. It's undoing a rate decrease. Um, it's your office's uh, intent to send that through the um, PUAB. We can take it back. It's actually already been recommended by the Utility Advisory Board. Oh, that's right. That was yeah. at the end of last year, wasn't it? And uh, so okay. we use this budget as a vehicle to bring that forward into the um, public policy arena for council consideration. My apologies. No, quite. That's quite my right. COVID brain. Sorry. A couple things going on in the city any given moment. There has been. Yeah. Thank you. Um, was there anything else that specific, uh, particularly stuck out to you uh, in the in the details of this while you were going through it or putting it together? Uh, this budget is a significant increase over last year's budget, but I think we should make clear that that is due in large part to the increased capital spending. Um, investing more and investing more aggressively in the infrastructure of the city whether it be the water main replacement program, so we don't end up in a situation with high numbers of water main breaks and customers without service and businesses without service, uh, or whether it's the renovation, uh, expansion, building new of the fire stations as was promised in the November 2021 fire sales tax issue. Uh, so that is a significant change, but I think it is one that will have a um, physical impact on the appearance of this community. 
I wanted to ask you about that uh, specifically, and of course you said uh, Chief Short will be presenting on that, and I'll probably have some questions for him. Uh, but in, in foreshadowing for that, uh, I know we have one fire station that's built right up against the border of our city. Uh, does that st study or is his recommendation going to include uh, removing that station or per repurposing it? I, I am a little flat-footed on the specifics of the station locations right now. I, I kind of had I fair enough we'll had the budget on later. the brain, so I apologize. But um, that conversation is barreling your way very soon. No worries. My apologies. No, it's Didn't quite all right. Off guard. Um, uh, that's it. Uh, all for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I could. Councilmember Hobart, could I have you take the chair just for a few minutes and uh, lay the discussion? I think you have some questions. Is that true? I do. So if, if you'd come and shake the chair, and uh, I will turn it over to Councilmember Fears, and then I'll be right back. Yeah, of course. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. City Manager, just a, a general comment in that um, I appreciate the work that goes into this uh, probably as much as anybody. Um, having done that in in a previous life, um, and uh, and what the staff uh, does to get that to happen, um, I'm anxious to get into the the details. That's pro I'm going to really defer my questions till I after I have a chance to get into the details since you just handed these to us tonight. Um, uh, I, I am appreciative of the expansion of the 52 items that that um, you're able to you know accomplish uh, towards our priorities I think the idea of a priority based budget is a great idea and um, and really excited to see that come to fruition over the next year or so um, you know my primary concern is on your chart where um, you showed the uh, unassigned balance of the general fund um, and you know that would be zeroed out in in essentially three years from now um, and you know trying to plan longer term and taking some action now I'm, I'm glad we we're able to increase a little bit this year so that we can hopefully defer that a little bit farther um, I, I think you know what I would challenge you and the staff to do is to put together some, you know, the, the plans to inc both increase revenue and, and re find ways to reduce expenses and change things so that we don't get to there because obviously nobody wants to get there. Um, and I know that's your plan, but I just want to um, commend you for that and, and also continue that encouragement. I'm, I've got a number of questions I wrote down as you went through your um, your uh, presentation. I think I'll hold all, all of that until after uh, I have a chance to really get into the budget and look at the details. And uh, But I'm anxious to do that and look forward to further discussions. Likewise. Thank you. Anyone else other questions? Mr. Mayor. Please proceed. I just had a question about the 6%. Um, I don't know if it's a rate increase or, as Councilmember Hobart said, taking away the due decrease. We currently have a moratorium, I believe, that has a year left on it that a previous council passed. So would that be in violation of that moratorium, or how would that process work? So uh, the, the budget really represents a proposal to the council, and there are oftentimes follow-up actions that have to be taken. So in this case, um, that would necessitate a recension of the resolution that um, put that in place four years ago. Um, so we would bring that forward for council consideration um, um, to see if you're supportive of that. I'm assuming that would have to be done before the budget was passed, would that be? It, it would probably be wise to do that because uh, the budget is built around the anticipated revenues from that. Um, so if we need to take a different course, we would need to have a little time for contingency planning on that. Okay, that's all I have, thank you. Please proceed. Mr. City Manager, you had mentioned interfund charges, uh, and I, I always want to help people understand terms that don't have a definition with them. Uh, would you remind 
uh, people who are listening what that means. Right. So uh, the city, in order to ensure that its monies are spent only on the activities for which they're intended, has set up different funds. Um, most of us are used in our personal lives to having a checking account and savings account. At the city, uh, picture, you know, anywhere uh, as, depending on the year, as many as uh, 10 to 12 different funds that we deposit monies in. Uh, an example to be illustrative might be uh, Independence Power and Light. It is its own separate fund in the city. The revenues collected from your utility bills are deposited in that fund and then spent only uh, on activities associated with that fund. But the electric utility may receive services from a different aspect of the city, for example, uh, human resources or financial um, management services. Those services will charge that utility like a business for their services rendered, and those monies are transferred from the electric utility fund to those funds that I just mentioned. So it is re reflective of a payment for service between two different entities within the city, inter-fund. And just as a reminder, I know that your office uh, and um, your finance office have spent a lot of time being sure that each one of these departments pays their way. So rather than them purchasing accounting activity outside the city, they are charged to the accounting department. So. Um, there was concern earlier about street lights. I know that those are in the general fund. Uh, so IPL does not pay the costs associated with those the city general fund does. So IPL is just containing its own costs. So it is a complete unit for all of its costs, as is water, as is water pollution control. Am I uh, correct? Very well said. Uh, I used the example going one way, but that's very true. The, the general fund is then transferring money to power and light reflective of the cost of those services. Um, the parks fund is paying power and light the cost for their utilities, water. All of, so all of these different funds in the city are paying one another for services rendered. Thank you very much. Anyone else, other questions? Uh, I've got a whole host of them, but I won't trouble you with all of them now when we meet in our regularly regular meetings will cover that but I do have three of them and I think they're pretty important for us to talk about as a high level if you can go to slide number 16 that is how the general fund dollars are spent and that's the breakdown of a dollar bill so if you can go to the slide 16 and then we'll go to up from there I've got three of you passed it so I clicked really fast and now, you, you're now it's got to catch up though. sure yeah there you go there we go. Uh -huh. So what I'd like to know here is, I know how it's broken down and you can see the numbers there and I'm gonna ask you to, to define that, but I would like to see us have a comparison between uh, say Blue Springs, Lee Summit, are there other cities that's in the state of Missouri that we should probably compare to to see how their budget is broken down in comparison to ours with regards to police, fire, and all of that. Uh, that I think it would be helpful for me to understand what uh, where we're getting it, and I would also like somebody to do an analysis of where do they get their their large chunks of revenue. Uh, you know, is it sales tax, is it property tax, things like that. So when people ask me that question, I can explain to them, this is the differences between uh, Blue Springs, Lee Summit, Independence, this is the revenues they typically get, this is where they expend it. And I realize I'm not the mayor of Blue Springs, not the mayor of Independence, or excuse me, of well, maybe not, all depends on the recall, uh, but uh, <laughs> Uh, of Lee Summit and Blue Springs, but I would like to be able to have that comparison. And I know that, uh, I hope that's not a daunting task, I just want a really high level, almost like this, you know, big picture, not precise, not gonna ask me to go take it down to the penny, but if that'd be helpful if somebody could do that. I know you've got a management analyst and I don't know if they could do that for us. Our finance and budget team will do that. Our cities are great about resource sharing information with one another, so um, some of the peer cities around us Maybe a couple of the cities of similar population like Columbia would be helpful. Probably one that I only one I would not recommend is Kansas City because right. state statute has, much to my police chief's dismay, state statute has not set a threshold for our uh, general fund budget for the police department, but Kansas City has. Right. Uh, and that goes way back to the 1930s uh, and the corruption that occurred there. But anyway, that's a whole different equation, a whole different story. On the next slide, slide 17, general fund unassigned balance. Uh, obviously that graph is disturbing. What are the big factors that are impacting that and 
what should we do as a council? You don't have to answer those questions now, but that'd be something I would like you to think about and, and kind of get back to me on that. Uh, but I'd like to know more about that one. Uh, and then going back to the 6% that was just asked earlier, that's slide 25. And that's the uh, slide for IPL. And so obviously there's, there are several projections on that. And there are several assumptions with regards to how that's going forward. But um, is this projection with the 6% being included? That is not. That is indicative of no change. Okay. So if we go to no change, that's what the, the fund looks like going forward. If we add a 6%, when, when we have this budget discussion on the 15th, could we get one that would show us what the 6% is? And I believe you have done that before, but I'd like to see that. So everybody's there when they're having that budget discussion on the 15th, if we could add yep. that. We, uh, I'll make certain we put together a slide deck specifically on that so the council can see, um, compare and contrast side by side. Yeah, because obviously IPL is such a big issue for this council. That's why we've taken the action that we have in order to make a comparison about, you know, uh, if we keep IPL, what do we have to do to make it sustainable for the long term? Or if we were to sell it, what would be the, the factors there? And then obviously have a tax, or excuse me, not a tax, but a vote of the uh, voters uh, to determine what they would choose in that matter. But I think it's an important question because uh, both of those graphs that we just saw on slide, I believe it's 17, and on this one on slide 25 uh, are concerning. Then uh, will this uh, PowerPoint be out there so uh, people can download it from? Yes, if the uh, citizens or any other interested party will go to where council agendas are at on the city website, this presentation, presentation of the fiscal year 23-24 budget will be hyperlinked and it will pull this up. I apologize it wasn't out there ahead of time, but. I understand, you're working we were, under time we were, constraints and. We were pulling it together up until the last minute, so um, we didn't get it to you in advance for review, which is not our typical practice, but we'll get it out there uh, for digestion over the next 45 days or so. Yeah, I, that's, you know, I've had people ask, hey, can I get a copy of the presentation? And I think it's helpful for them to have it. And let me also, um, make clear that the budget proposed budget uh, the same book that you've all received will be online and madam city clerk if i'm correct a physical copy is in your office as well uh, if anybody wants to come up and view the physical copy yep and we all are proud owners of this so thank you for giving that to us and thank you for the presentation and I want to thank the staff. Uh, excellent job. I know it takes a tremendous amount of time to do this, uh, as well as stress and heartburn and all of that. And are your assumptions correct? And, and then I'm sure you uh, discuss and cuss the assumptions just like all of us do and say, are we on track and are we on target? Which goes to Councilmember Steinmeier's uh, question earlier, which was basically about the assumptions. What assumptions are they and what impact does it have for us? So I just want to say thank you for all of your work. Uh, I know the budgets are always a challenging task, and because the revenue sources that we have in comparison to other cities here, we don't have the, the robust revenues that, that other cities have to make it, uh, so you've got to run on a little bit tighter, leaner budget in that regard. But anyway, with anyone else, any other questions? Can, can I, please since, proceed. Since we're, doing the, since we're doing an analysis on some of the information, especially with the 6%, I'd like to review yeah. how we came to, because we weren't here, Yep. Um, the moratorium on the 6% rate increase, but also when we pay a municipality, a municipality rate, correct? The, the council approved a municipal facilities rate yeah. for... At the same time as this? I think no, it sep was. separate at a different time. Well, was it pretty close in, or was it... When was that? When did that happen? Is that 2020? Yeah. So I'd like I'd like to see that. Yeah, as let well. me put together a memo with a timeline I'd that's like got to see that right. all of this comprehensively put together. You're like, right. Many of you weren't here at that time. Right. So I'd like to see the rate prior to and then what it That's very the, very appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. City Council Member. Anyone else? Uh, and then what we have the next on the agenda is and I put my agenda away and it's hidden. Help me out here. It's boards and commissions reports. That's right, boards and commissions reports. Thank you, and now I found it. So if you can proceed, I'd be grateful. 
Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, Street Improvement Oversight Committee, Councilmember McCandless would like to recommend appointing Marcy Grog to that committee. If there's no objections, this resolution is on the agenda for May 15th. Anything else? That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. So, Boards of Commissions, uh, Mr. City Manager, anything else from your perspective? No, sir. Nothing tonight. Okay. Anyone else on council? With that, we'll call this meeting to adjourn. Thank you.